time for change in the context of how universities make offers, whether applicants are being advised and guided properly in the context of change courses, unconditional offers, other incentive schemes, universities accepting direct applications, um, different entry routes. You know, the, the world is different, I think, now compared to what it was certainly 30, 40 years ago, even when universities expanded significantly in the early part of the 90s. So it's good to get a really strong panel here. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, and then I've got an order of, of speaking, um, which is going to be Chris first, followed by Karis, followed by Mike, Michelle, and then David to put an international perspective in. In your program and online, you've got speaker biographies, of course, but I'll ask the uh, panelists to introduce themselves and then we'll get the conversation going. Again, we're really keen to get your own opinions, impressions, and questions too. So. Thanks, James. Uh, my name is Mike Nicholson. I'm Director of Undergraduate Admissions and Outreach at the University of Bath and also a trustee of uh, the AQA exam board. Uh, so I'm Chris Ramsey, I'm headmaster of Whitgift School in South London and I chair the uh, HMC, GSA and ASCL Higher Education Committee. Hello everybody, I'm Michelle Morgan. Oh, it sounds like a university challenge it's panel, fantastic. doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from Bournemouth University, I'm a student experience specialist. I'm very much here talking with my um, previous life of a departmental manager, faculty manager, learning teaching coordinator and student experience manager and now academic manager hat on. So I'm looking at, looking at it in a 360 degree way. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Hawkins. I specialise in helping students apply to universities all around the world um, as an affiliated consultant to the Council of International Schools. Um, this year I've helped students apply to universities in the UK, Ireland, Canada, the USA, Netherlands, Belgium, France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, and Japan. So hopefully <laughs> have some international context to bring to this discussion. And finally, I'm Karis Fisher. I'm a senior policy executive at UCAS, the universities and colleges admissions service. Okay. Chris, you're going to go first. OK. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's great to, to speak uh, for a few minutes. I think I, I've been given five to six. And the brief uh, was, uh, is the university admission system fair? Is it transparent? Is it time for a reboot? Uh, and uh, I'm just going to offer a school perspective and talk about some, uh, some of the issues that we find in schools, whether we can and should tinker with the current system, uh, and finally what a reboot might look like. Uh, so uh, first of all, some issues. I mean, UCAS, uh, I think we feel in schools, does great work. But, but after all, UCAS has not changed at all uh, since its inception, I, I think so 50 or so years ago. Uh, and the issues that, that are current in schools at the moment are, are something like as follows. Firstly, and, and none of these will surprise you, predicted grades and what we call OHAL, offer high, accept low. Um, I'll explain what that means in a moment. Uh, the recent Universities and College Union report said uh, and I quote, only 16% of applicants achieved the A-level grade points that they were predicted to achieve based on their best three A-levels. However, the vast majority, 75% of applicants, were over-predicted, i.e. their grades, were pred uh, grades predicted were higher than they actually achieved. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds and state schools are more likely to be over-predicted, whilst those at independent schools receive more accurate predictions, close quote. Now, there's a good reason for this. To get an offer to a university, uh, given what we believe in schools to be often widely inflated tariffs, you need high predictions. But in the current demographic climate, uh, many universities will accept their, their, their students in August on lower grades than the original offer. I consider this to be unhealthy. Uh, it's quite right, widespread in what I've written here are second tier high tariff institutions. Uh, we could discuss that later. Uh, and that's my number one issue. Second issue, unconditional offers. Do I need to say more? Now, there are many cases in which unconditional offers are helpful and the right thing, but there are many where they aren't. And I believe that WP candidates, so disadvantaged students, are more likely to be tempted by them so in fairness terms, I would say, are they really fair? 
Uh, third issue, uh, what we call dark clearing. I don't know if that's a, a, an expression people know about that. That's offers made uh, unofficially under the radar and without going through UCAS. We could discuss that more later. And black holes, another expression some people know and some people don't. That's the gap, from a school perspective, between your first response when you've submitted your UCAS form as a sixth former and your last. Just imagine, for example, a year 13 cohort who all apply together pretty much at the same time, which is very common in schools. Uh, the record quick response that we know of an HMC is just under two hours. Um, and uh, uh, the longest, of course, might be something like dentistry or anywhere that offers, uh, operates a gathered feel, field, which might be in the spring. So that could be October to March, uh, that hole between the first, yes, I've got an offer, and the final one. Uh, just imagine how unhelpful that is to sixth forms. And final issue, conservatism, with a small c. It's the disease of the independent sector in particular. 75% in, in 2017 of independent school leavers applied to 15% of available courses at 14% of available institutions. But I would argue that the UCAS system militates against risk because one application means as a student you are going to make five similar choices. And the rhetoric around Russell Group equals good and, uh, uh, and vocational engineering, uh, medicine and so on and so forth are, are king, mean we are narrowing course choices. So there are some issues. So can we tinker? Well, firstly, we could, or UCAS could, publish actual acceptance grades course by course. Uh, and that would help with that offer high, accept low problem. We could, secondly, tighten rules all round. We could, for example, as uh, one university's minister I think was proposing, uh, make unconditional offers attract a university penalty or restrict their number. And that might help, but how does that square with institutional autonomy? Or we could try and encourage risk taking by supporting unusual courses, but the Orga Review seems a little bit reticent to do that. And finally, we could try to be fairer uh, on those uh, with disadvantages without disadvantaging those who are doing well anyway by increasing the number of university places available. But will we? There doesn't seem to be much appetite for that either. So finally for me, what might a complete reboot look like? Well, I have four blue sky options uh, and they go from uh, obvious to a uh, bit more wacky. Uh, firstly, the obvious post-qualification admissions. I mean, that, I, I imagine people are going to talk about that. Let's get that out of the way. Um, overall, personally and on behalf of my sector, I think we are in favour on balance. And interestingly, I now don't meet anybody in higher education who isn't in favour, which makes one wonder quite what the blockage is. But obviously we would lose some institutional loyalty uh, and we'd have timetable problems. Or secondly, what about a completely free applications market? Or what about applying to university like you apply for a job, for as many as you like, but with only one acceptance possible through some uh, mechanism there? Or, the opposite, what about centralising even more? What about going for quotas, universities to take certain proportions of certain population groups? And I know the Vice-Chancellor of Middlesex, for example, has argued in favour of that kind of comprehensivisation of the university sector. Or finally, we could move to a more, if you like, American style of admissions. It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, going, and I, David will probably have some more to say about this, going occasionally to uh, overseas universities in places like Holland, they are perplexed how stressed we get in the UK about admissions and then spend very little time wondering about the student experience. So maybe we should turn it on its head. Less stress about finding the place for your first university course, more local, perhaps even comprehensive style first degrees, and then more competition and selection for higher degrees. Uh, well, I hope we'll have a good debate. What's clear to me is that the unholy mixture of creeping OFS control, government control by proxy, amidst the rhetoric of institutional freedom, 
is not working. It's not particularly fair, even in the terms of its own remit, although it's fairer than some would admit. It's not that transparent, uh, and it could be time for a reboot. Thank you. She's got the fun job. <laughs> <laughs> Following that, yeah. Um, so I'm obviously from UCAS, um, and contrary to, to some of what Chris has said, I think we certainly say that we've evolved significantly um, since our inception more than 50 years ago. Um, so we've changed from what was a bygone era of paper applications, um, actual physical offer letters, to what we offer today, which is a fully digital um, and scalable service. Um, great example of that is that we process in the region of 3.8 million results each year, most of which are processed over a single weekend in August. Um, so certainly something that, that hasn't kind of stood still in time but has evolved to in order to continue to meet needs of customers. Um, so today uh, we work with students, we work with their teachers and their advisors and the HE sector to deliver what we feel is our core purpose, which is essentially a trusted and accessible admission service. Um, each year we support around about 700,000 applicants um, from more than 200 countries in um, accessing higher education. And we're really pleased to say that our satisfaction rates are really high. So students overall express a headline satisfaction rate of about 92%, which is pretty impressive. Um, certainly a feature of our system is its consistency um, and that's something that's sometimes lost in, in these kind of debates. Um, I was actually at our secondary education advisory group just this week, so speaking to schools about this and understanding how much they really value the consistency that they get from UCAS in terms of dates, deadlines, processes, continuity and that's at a time when, when resource in schools is, is increasingly scarce. Um, our service is very much designed around student choice. Um, which again is a kind of differential feature of the, of the UK higher education sector. Um, and indeed, last year, 78% of students achieved a place at their first choice university or college, um, with a further 7% receiving a place at their second choice provider. Um, and it's also really heartening to know that we don't see a gap when we look at the spectrum of advantage across that statistic. So you're actually equally likely to get a place at your first choice university or college, regardless of your background. Um, talking a bit about clearing, obviously um, clearing today is very much a mainstream route. Um, so more than 60,000 students um, each year accepted through clearing of whom around about 10,000 go on to the most selective universities and of whom 17,500 are applying for the first time through that clearing service. Um, we also have a service called Adjustment which allows students to um, effectively make more aspirational choices whilst incurring no risk. Um, Notwithstanding all of that, we're, you know, we're certainly not standing still at UCAS. Um, you know, we're continuing looking to work with customers in order to evolve our services. Um, we're really aware of the changeable political environment, the regulatory reforms that, that, that have been mentioned already, um, and indeed the evolving needs of customers that, that frankly um, want and, and need us to, to do more. Um, so a great example of that is in the information and advice space. Um, we all know that what students need to make informed decisions is relevant and personalised information and advice. Uh, and for the first time we really think that we're looking at kind of making some inroads into, into that um, goal. So our UCAS hub, which is our new information and advice service, is currently in beta form but will be rolled out in September will basically see for the first time us able to surface personalised information and advice to applicants based entirely on their preferences and their interests. Um, so that's a great example of where we're responding to that need for more, more information to be tailored to that individual. Um, there's an awful lot out there, we all know that, and sometimes, um, you know, certainly for your average 18-year-old, that can be quite an intimidating uh, place to be. Um, we're also undertaking a wholesale redevelopment of our application service itself, um, so it will look and feel very different. Um, and this is allowing us the opportunity to really think about, for example, the questions that we ask. Um, and in order to support particularly the widening participation agenda, we're going to be introducing some new questions which will allow applicants to self-declare information, such as whether or not they are 
uh, a carer, whether or not they have parental responsibility, um, are estranged from their, their parents or guardians. Um, so all of these developments are designed to support students in being able to um, contextualise their own application, but also to support the sector in you know, better identifying these students at an earlier stage, which is really critical in terms of putting that support in place um, through transition. So I guess for UCAS, it's not about a reboot, it's about an insatiable desire to evolve our services, to develop what we do, um, to respond to what we call the voice of our customers, in order to continue to deliver a service that meets their needs and delivers against what are clearly really important objectives in terms of uh, fairness and transparency. Thank you, Karen. Okay, Mike. Okay, um, so a number of different issues I think I would like to focus on. Firstly, I very much agree with Chris that we need greater transparency behind what goes on when candidates apply, how universities actually make decisions, and also uh, what basis decisions are made on. I think it is uh, perfectly possible for us to have a system where students can see what the previous cycle's candidates achieved, and it's equally possible for the higher education sector to know how good schools are at predicting outcomes. And actually, if we had transparency on both of those issues, there would be a certainly less ability and incentive to game the system. I think we need to also recognize that one of the greatest challenges that the current system faces is the marketization of higher education, the declining number of 18-year-olds in the UK, and all of the instability that the system currently has at a point in time when uh, many universities are working very hard to try and reach targets that are probably unrealistic, and that drives some of the negative behaviours that we've heard already, particularly the unconditional offers. And I do think one of the areas that, um, if we are going to have a unified collaborative system in this country for admissions, we do need to revisit the whole issue of universities behaving responsibly to ensure that students get fair treatment. Um, I think we are too resistant to the idea that there are opportunities for universities to play and game the system. Uh, unconditional offers is one example. Uh, a more prevalent example, I think, is where students are put under undue pressure before the end of March, which is, of course, the duration that the decision-making period uh, is, and we've all agreed to, um, to then firm up their decisions because universities start opening up accommodation applications or incentivizing students or de-incentivizing students to delay making decisions. So there is much we could be doing just within the structures of the existing system to make people more collaborative and collegiate in their behavior. I think that we also need to recognize though that students are not equally served or supported by what happens before they get to university. And I think one of the interesting changes in rhetoric in the last 18 months, two years, is an increasing suggestion that it is higher education's responsibility to deal with some of the challenges that exist previously in the system, as though we can wave a magic wand and deal with all of the challenges that students have faced prior to the point of admission to higher education. But I also think that we can be doing a lot more to follow and track student outcome. Um, it's always been one of my greatest bet noirs about universities that make unconditional offers on a significant scale, that nobody seems to have challenged them to produce hard evidence that those students who are admitted unconditionally have performed as well, or if they haven't, what measures of support the university has put in place to ensure that those students are supported effectively, particularly through their first year. I do think that we get very carried away with the possibilities that technology offers. Uh, I appreciate, Karis, that UCAS has done an awful lot to improve systems, but it's not so long ago that the system fell over on clearing day uh, starting. And at best, at the moment, about 9% of students are placed through the clearing system. 9% get their places as insurance choices. So we've still got quite some way to go before we could have a whole system that operated with 100% of applicants making their applications and then being sorted in a very short space of time, unless 
we went down the route that most PQA systems operate, which is where your grades, and only your grades, dictate which university you go to. And if, in my opinion, we were looking for a definite way to embed privilege within the admission system, it would be to ensure that the only thing that mattered was your grades. Because if we've learned nothing in the last 20 years of access and participation work, it is the school that you've been at and the support that you've had at that school is the thing that is most likely to influence your qualifications outcomes. And I do think that therefore the sector can learn a lot uh, from looking at other education systems, but I think the real strength of the current system in the UK is that it allows universities time to build relationships with students. Uh, at Bath, one of the key changes we've made in recent years is to put within the admissions team a small subunit whose job it is is to support students who have flagged up any element of disruption to their study, mitigating circumstance, who are identified through our use of contextual data, students where they have mental health or disability declarations to ensure that those students are very effectively uh, assisted to make applications that will uh, get full and due scrutiny rather than being bypassed because the system is effectively trying to turn around and offer in as quick a time as possible in some belief that the only thing that students care about is a fast response. One final thing that we don't often talk about and one of the benefits I think of a non-PQA system is the fact that students will know before they have to take their qualifications roughly what the university is looking for, expecting of them. And I think in a system where we've moved away from a more modular process of post-16 assessment to a system where it's all very high stakes at the end for most qualification systems, actually students knowing what they've got to aim for can be quite a useful thing. I do recognise that uh, post-16 education is a very stressful time. I know that there's a strong argument to suggest that we should be looking for things that will take some of the pressure off for students. But I'm also very cognizant, given that 70% of the students at Bath will end up doing a placement as part of their degree. And most placement companies and organizations are nowhere near as uh, engaged with the idea of context when they're selecting students for placements and graduate entry schemes. Um, that uh, how you perform in your post-16 studies can have a big bearing on how you are treated for the rest of your life. Um, and we run the risk, I think, of uh, students being denied opportunities later in life if we don't encourage them to do as well as they possibly can in their post-16 and previous qualification. Hello. Well, I'm going to be quite grumpy, and um, I'm going to argue for a PQA system. But I have a very personal reason behind this. For those of you who are old enough, when PCAS and UCA were in existence, we were allowed to apply to both Polytechnics and, and UCA. 1986, in 1986, I did better in my A-levels than predicted. Every university application was rejected. I got two places from Polytechnics. I didn't want to go to either of them because the one I really wanted to go to basically didn't give me a place. I ended up having to take a year out. I ended up taking three years out. And so it delayed me being engaged. And th it, this was against the backdrop of my parents not believing in higher education, almost disowning me because I wanted to go to higher education. And so for me, these are the reasons why I think we need to reboot the system we've got. We've got a marketised landscape. And I think in the last 10 years especially, because we've got that declining population that we're talking about, we have actually forgotten about the student. And what the last 10 years for me has been about is about institutional survival. And this has been down to government and university policy and processes. I'm going to touch upon unconditional and conditional offers. I don't think they're a bad thing. And actually what we need to do is understand the data behind it instead of the headlines. And also touch upon the reasons for a post-qualification system. Now, setting the higher education scene into context, in 1922 and 23, 9,200 first degrees were awarded. By 1950, this increased to 17,300. Now, bearing in mind the admission systems didn't actually come in until 1961, I believe it was, for UCA. All right. PCAS 
most of the students went to the polys and actually applied to them directly. And a lot, an awful lot of those, maybe something like, um, I think Ronald Kay said something like 40% made the application in August and September. So what we've seen in the behaviour of applications to PCAS and also to UCA, it started to change. And as we know in 93, UCAS came into existence and HESA started keeping data. So we had a massive, massification of the system. So what some of you may not be aware is the talk about a post-qualification admission system is not new. And UCAS did this report and it's really well worth reading. Okay, 2012, go onto their website. It's fascinating to read the reasons why, the support and the lack of support. And basically, one of the main reasons behind the institutions and the colleges and schools that were spoken to it really didn't get off the ground was, it was felt that the summer was too condensed a time to be able to do the process. Um, basically, 81% felt that a post-qualification admission system could restrict offer flexibility. It would not be agile enough to fit around other systems, but they absolutely identified that it would make the system more efficient because you would have fewer applications being processed and it would make financial savings. But 2012 was a very, very different environment. And basically, the rejection was around process. And I think this is something that we, in a new landscape, have to consider. We've got a decline in 18-year-old population. We've got much more marketization. For many institutions, admission systems have been centralized to save money. So whereas the faculty would actually do them and actually make in-house decisions, that's now been centralized. It starts to it starts to separate the academic imperative as part of an application. It's led to the rise of conditional offers being sent out before interview days, before students come on applicant days and actually have a look at the course because the marketing imperative is get the offer out because that's what captures the student. And that has very much, in my opinion, driven the conditional and unconditional offer that started and especially going up since about 2014. More and more students in the last year have gone straight into clearing than any other year before. So students are being strategic and starting to change the way they behave. You know, it's not a surprise if you read the OIA that complaints have gone up about university. We've seen the 9K a year introduction of fees. This changes the dynamics of parents, of guardians, of students, of applicants about value for money. And for me, it feels like we've now got a system that doesn't have the applicant at the heart of it, but it's the process and it's the institution that are. And let's be clear, you know, not reading all the supporting statements is not new, neither is but given a place based on predicted grades only. That's not new. These are things that have happened and we know predicted grades are not good necessarily good. They, are, they can be very effective, sorry, but not necessarily accurate as we already know. And what I would say is, don't read the headlines, read the UCAS data on unconditional behaviour, because this is really important information, not the headlines. You know, the fifth biggest group where the unconditional offers are made are in the creative courses. It's where you've got portfolios, okay? This is important to remember. You know, if a teacher looks at a piece of work and doesn't think it's good, but then a university lecturer thinks, do you know something? That's creative, that's innovative. And based on that, we're going to give them an unconditional. Is that wrong? No, I don't believe it is. You know, um, conditionals and unconditional offers are mainly made to high attaining applicants. And I think that's where the biggest fall was in the students who were supposed to have got the best or the, the top, the top grades. And what is not covered, I don't believe, is the power of the individual to make their decisions. And I don't believe, as we all know, it's reflective of a university outcome. Sitting before you is someone who's basically written off at 16. I'm now associate professor with a PhD. Education changed my life. It changes the lives of everyone. And we have to make sure that we have a system in place. We need a different landscape where students can actually, can actually make choices that are right for them. If they make the wrong choice, they are saddled with thousands and thousands of pounds of debt. And if AUGA is to be implemented, moderate earners will not only pay double that, but they will pay it for longer and over 40 years. We need to make sure that when the student engages with higher education, they make the right decision. 
I think it needs to be revisited and reconsidered. We need to think how we can actually um, adapt the timelines. We need, as institutions, to think how we do it clearly and fairly. And I do think we need to bring in more contextualised offers. In that desire to get an offer out, we're not necessarily reading the applications and making a, 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 an offer based on that. And I don't believe that we should, uh, if the system does not change, that we should abandon the concept of the conditional, unconditional. If a student comes to an institution or get, uh, having had an offer and then comes to the university and says, you know, I'm a disabled student, I really want to come to this institution, this is the only institution I can, I can go to, their offer goes from a conditional to an unconditional. That is not bad. And my fear with all the headlines and the attitude is that we're going to throw the concept out of the window when it can actually have a massive impact on students. I would also say I would strongly encourage to take, get students to take out a year out. You know, the loan's not going to go away. The debt's not going to go away. You get your A-levels, take a year out, think about what you want to do, because actually you may very well change your opinion. I did. Students I don't believe today are any different. And what I would say is, I suspect that as the 18-year-old population starts to increase, many of the issues about the conditional and unconditionals will start to slip away. But what I would say, in conclusion, is as a sector, we've got to stop finding reasons not to change, and we have got to start finding solutions to make things happen. Very straightforward overseas. <laughs> you're going to give us an insight in that. I'll do my best. Yeah. I'm used to being the sort of, and now let's talk about everything international at the end of the talk, so I'll try and get us back on track in terms of time. Um, I'd like to start by, by kind of pretending I'm still a teacher and, and opening up a little bit and asking everyone just to kind of do a little activity with me. And something I, I do with the students when I go to schools and talk, talk, talk about international universities. And bear with me for a second while I ask you to consider an analogy. Um, I'm going to ask you to think of a word. And in your head, I want you to kind of conjure up the image of that word. Um, and the word is football. So I'm hoping in your head you're thinking of a game of 11 v 11 and a round ball. And the idea is to kick that ball into, into a goal. So when I say the word football, I'm Im imagining and hoping that's what a lot of people think. Um, and I use that analogy because it's a word that means something in a particular context. Now, in two weeks' time, actually, today, James and I will be in Canada at the International Association of College Admissions Counselling's conference, and we'll be talking actually about unconditional offers. And if I asked that same question in Canada, the image in people's heads would be something different. And if I said football in the middle of Ireland, it would be different, and football in Australia would be different. And the reason for that analogy is, university is the same. Why well, I ask you all here at the Festival of HE in Buckingham to just think about university, you conjure up one image. And in the context of today, we think of one way how universities select students. And the work that I do, and I'm very fortunate to have a career helping students from one system navigate the process for a completely different system, it's really, really hard to get them to take their preconceptions of what university is and, more importantly, how a university selects students, to take those preconceptions out of their heads. And actually, the, what we're talking about today needs a global context, because the way UK universities select students mm is actually quite odd on a global scale. Um, and when you work with students from all sorts of different countries and they're potentially applying to four, five, six different country systems, UK is only one way we do it. And on the spectrum of how we do it, we are a bit of an outlier. Um, and in, so in the context of this debate, in fact, the context of this conference, I think one of my frustrations is we have these conversations without looking at how other countries do it. I notice on the, on the programme today, and I'm not, not bashing James at all, but in a sector of higher education which is so overwhelmingly anti-Brexit, we only have two non-UK non universities represented on the speaking panels here. That's despite the fact that IE University from Spain, the University of British Columbia from Canada and NYU have full-time staff based in the UK. I was with them yesterday at Bradfield College. And yet so much of our debate is kind of ignoring the fact that we talk about widening participation without looking at traditions of open access university admissions in Western Europe. We talk about conditional offers and unconditional offers when you talk to an American university about conditional offers, they think we're nuts. That how do you run a university system when you don't know on May the 1st who's coming in your door? Um, when we talk about PQA, we don't look at Australia or, or the Irish variation of PQA. You know, a 50-minute flight away, we have a country running PQA. And we don't look at the strengths and weaknesses of that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of thinking when we, we do that analogy of what we think university is, is not necessarily the way in other countries. I think that's a really important context. And, I kind of throw that out a little bit more with a quote that I heard a few years ago at um, the conference at the University of Durham. 
And they were using this to describe the collegiate system, but I'll think it, to use it to talk actually about UCAS and without wishing to bash UCAS too much. We say about the NHS, if the NHS is so good, why doesn't every country have one? And if UCAS is so good, why isn't every other country in the world running their university process like UCAS? Why is no other country in the world running the university system process for UCAS? And I think one of the things that's really important, and the, the point that when we talk about a reboot I would like to get across, is that UCAS is an ecosystem. It's not an application system, there is everything involved in UCAS. And that has a massive strength, that you get UCAS conferences, where you can go as an advisor, you can go as universities, and you can go to UCAS conference. You can go to UCAS fairs, and students can sit there. You can go onto UCAS website and get the IMG. You can get UCAS as a system where you as a school control when the application gets sent, and you get to hear offers back and all that kind of stuff. Nowhere in the world is doing that. Study Link in the Netherlands are not running fairs. Common App are not running conferences. There's huge excitement in the US that there's a thing called Slate, where schools might actually find out where their students got into. Um, and so we need to understand that all these things are, are kind of different. And I think in the context of discussing a reboot, when you look at things from a global perspective, and there is at some point an Ed D in this for me somewhere, how a, universe, how a country runs its university assist, admission system kind of is a, a snapshot into the culture of that country. Mm. And actually, you look at UCAS, I think the purposes under which UCAS was set up for, for a relatively small proportion of the population, to go and study a subject or closely related subjects at university is no longer the society we are in now. And so fundamentally, in whatever we talk about in terms of systems and PQA and timings and IAG and computer systems, I would say we need to look slightly more deeper than that as to actually what is the purpose of our university admission system? And if we're trying to say that we, you know age 17 what you want to study for the next three or four years of your life, we know that is not the case. I have an entire job funded from students who look at UCAS and say, I don't know what I want to do, and therefore I'm going to look at another country. I work with students who use the US Common Application System to apply to UK universities, so they can apply to one university for five different courses and write separate personal statements for each of those. So I think in a discussion about Reboot, I think it's a much bigger discussion than just how does the system work. I think there's a deeper cultural thing of actually what is the purpose of our university system. And once we understand what that is, then we'll know how we should select students. So, Karis, do you want to respond briefly before we open it up to the floor? Um, so in terms of the international dimension, it's, you know, it's really interesting to hear about the way in different, different um, countries across the world run admission services. Um, UCAS is a member of the international organisation that brings together admission services globally. And um, what's really interesting is just reflecting on, on what um, David's just said, is that we actually hosted that conference last year and many of the attendees couldn't believe how um, brilliant a system and service UCAS is providing. And a lot of that is due to the fact that we're not just an admission service. And we're, uh, you know, our, our intention is never just to be an admission service. Our, our vision is about being at the heart of connecting to people to higher education. And that journey is, is far longer than simply being the form that you, you complete and send off. And there are advantages across the spectrum for that. Um, you know, schools um, having that insight around what, what are my students doing, who are they applying to, et cetera, that data that that, that gives, that rich progression data that they're then able to use to, to feed back into their planning and what have you. Equally on the provider end, having that sector-wide picture, understanding where the strengths and weaknesses are in, in, in terms of um, selection and recruitment is, is really important. So I think I'd just say that, that we're, we certainly aren't only an application form and we see that as a strength of, of UCAS, the, the service. And a question from me, you probably can't answer it, but I'll ask you it anyway. Do you think uh, you'll be under pressure in the next year to move to PQA? Um, I think, you know, it's an ongoing... Uh, PQA is post-qualification admissions, <laughs> by the way. So you apply after you've got your results. Yeah, so it's, it's a long-standing debate um, that we've been having for a number of years, as Michelle showed earlier. You know, we, we did a full-scale consultation back in 2012. Um, there we are. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we're really open to that discussion. Our view is that 
we have a post-qualification system, it's just that it's called clearing and it is available for people who wish to apply post results and indeed many do. Um, I think for us that is, isn't necessarily the solution but we absolutely accept that there are issues that um, mean that that is often positioned as a solution. So, um, you know, things such as accuracy of predicted grades, transparency around entry requirements, etc. But perhaps focusing all of our attention on that as the solution maybe detracts from wider conversations that could be had around how to tackle those underlying concerns. Thank you. David? Yeah, I just want to ask a question back to you and, and saying kind of the elephant in the room. We're at a university which accepts applications from UK students directly. That you, you don't have to use UCAS to apply to Buckingham. That's correct. And there Maybe are... Because we've got a January intake. Yeah. So we have a, yeah. a PQA system um, in some ways for our January intake where students can take a mini gap year having completed their examinations in the summer, received their results in August or whatever, and then come to us in January. So yeah. So universities, if they wanted to, to do PQA, they could. They could, and, and uh, there's a system which UCAS will explain perhaps a different yeah. time called RPA, which is where you can effectively you know, uh, have your place direct, yeah. and it's recognised by UCAS in the, in the wash-up at the end, yeah. of the end of the cycle. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do we think that clearing should be rebranded? If, if we've already got a PQA system, but everyone calls it clearing, and it's still got, even though we all know it's no longer a distressed purchase, um, it is, a, it is a, a strategic savvy decision that students are increasingly making. Should it be rebranded? Would that help? I, th I think that's a halfway house. The one thing I would say is, even with a PQA system, it's still not going to get over some of the poor behaviour that happens within universities of only using grades as the final decision making. And it is about ensuring that those offers are contextualised, even, even with post-qualification admissions. Because you could actually have somebody, a student who's gone through, has lost a, a parent or, you know, had, had extensive illness. And ha that's affected the grades that they got. So I think, you know, it's, it, a PQA is not going to get over some of the bad, not some of the bad practice, but some of the practice that happens that's quick for a quick turnaround. And in fact, one, one could argue could worsen that situation, certainly in terms of if we, if we think about contextual admissions, I know Mike touched on it earlier, the, you know, by sort of speeding up that process um, and also by having a situation whereby somebody would already be potentially be applying with their qualifications and grades, there's perhaps less incentive for um, others if we if we assume we're still in a marketized environment where we're looking to recruit um, students to actually look at that wider more holistic picture and not think about potential but think about solely about achievement two quick points then i want i want the audience to say a few words as well Chris first. Yeah, uh, there's an analogy which may or may not be helpful and that's around uh, admission to secondary school uh, typically at 11 plus where there are very strict national rules um, but actually, I think some of the best schools will um, almost sort of go against those rules by get, getting early conversations with people about what might be the best school for them later on in, in, uh, in a couple of years' time. The actual rules are you cannot make offers or demand acceptances by, except by certain dates. And you can see how that's a kind of nationalised system. It's there for reasons which are in some ways logical, but they mean you cannot be flexible around looking at the whole person in a way you could be if the whole thing was uh, over a longer period. Mike? We focus a lot on the fact that other education systems do things differently. It's partly because what we are generally trying to achieve within the UK higher education system is actually quite different to a lot of other education systems. Most other education systems don't make people make most of their key life choices at the ages of 14, 16, and 17, and 11. And, 11. Um, and we also don't have a system, and I've, having run two admissions operations where I've also been responsible for international recruitment, trying to explain to a US student why their approach to applying to Oxford needs to be different to their approach to applying to Harvard. It's because the type of thing we are looking for at Oxford when I worked there, and at Bath, where I work now, is very different from a US system, where students you know, are not deciding to be medics, or lawyers, or engineers. 
at the age of 17. So I think David's right. If we are looking at education systems elsewhere, we need to be at least looking at ones that are trying to deliver roughly the same outcomes. Or, as I suspect Michelle might suggest, we might want to think about what our own education system should be trying to deliver, which isn't necessarily forcing people down narrow pathways at a very early stage in life. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so, in the audience, please... Oh, fantastic. How about the gentleman there? You say, yeah. Yeah. And, and choose whether they want to be there long term, but also see what the universe and it gives them much more time to mature, collect, develop all these other soft skills that they need for professionalism anyway, because they're starting at very different points when they come in. Uh, has that been thought about or has that been considered? Mm. So, the question, by the way, that was a question generically about why is three year degree structured as it is, and wouldn't a generic first year be a better idea? I, mean, I, I think it's fascinating when you see we had a, a whole development. I guess going on for a decade or so again now with the new College of the Humanities coming in to try and sort of shake things up and do this. And now you know, those of us in the sector are aware that the London Interdisciplinary School is trying to do the same kind of things. Um, you look at, you know, the only hard data we have is that last year 5% of independent school leavers went outside the UK for their degree. And I think a lot of that is for that kind of model. Unifrog did some data recently of something like a third of students on Unifrog had looked outside the UK, done a search for outside the UK. So I think there's a, there's a potential challenge here for the sector for exactly that kind of thing. I think it is that, that issue, though, of we, are, we have a system. You know, it, it goes back to this you know, analogy of the debates of when we introduce comprehensive schools, is that you can introduce new schools, but you physically have buildings you have to put them in. We have a university sector. It does things in a certain way. To pause and stop and rebuild it is going to be hugely complicated. Um, but I think these discussions need to be had before we start to then look at how do we select students for that system, because otherwise we're going to keep running into these same issues of, is it the purpose really what we want it to do for the 21st century? I would also add, I mean, we do have elements within the education system in the UK which do allow that sort of um, flexibility. Most Scottish universities, you do a fairly general two years before you um, uh, specialise. That's why actually US and you, Scottish universities there's actually quite a lot of movement between uh, those sort of uh, groupings when they're thinking of applications. A lot of UK universities, Lancaster would be a good example, students pick three subjects in the first year irrespective of what they think they're coming to do. So we do have examples of it. I think the challenge is once students get locked into an institution, it takes quite a lot to then say, actually, you know what, having been here for a period of time, started to put down some roots, invested in it, how can I then start looking at transfers? We do get students who transfer between institutions. I think the biggest challenge we've got is that because institutions have quite a lot of control about how they organise themselves, what you do in the first year at one institution may not help you map on to the second year of another institution. And I think this is where the autonomy of the education system in the UK is a real barrier to that, whereas in many other systems, and particularly in the States with the state education that you can get, the kind of community college model then into advanced standing into a, into a university allows that, that credit transfer much, much more effectively. Mm. Question from our colleague. Can I just Daniel. come back to, yeah. I, I would say, I mean, the one thing I would say is over the years, for anyone who's worked in higher education for a while, you've seen this creeping quality assurance that very much drives the whole system. So actually trying to do something slightly different is really hard. Yeah. You know, we could be, we've been talking about credit transfers for being formalised. We've been talking about two-year degrees. You know, we, we need to think creatively, like um, accrediting modules at postgraduate master's level so people can actually do little bits of learning to, to continue their lifetime of learning. But we don't. We are a tanker that is very hard to actually one stop, let alone change direction. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I've worked in uh, higher education for virtually all of my adult life, and the longer I've worked in it, the more I've wondered why we're so keen that so many students do come at 18. To me, the ideal would be everyone would take a gap year, and during that year they would apply to university. They would also gain a lot of these soft skills 
or maybe take up apprenticeships, or maybe decide university isn't for them. But how could we ever move from the system we have now to that system because there will be a year in which universities wouldn't have any students and would all go bust. So <laughs> if, if we were to try and change the system, how can we actually change it? I think it's already starting to change though. You're starting to see students take time out. I mean, the UCAS figures show that not only students coming straight into the clearing, they're not actually going through the process, they're actually taking time out before they come back. So there's a natural inclination, and maybe that's because of the, because of the fees. And what we do know is if they take a year out, one, it gives them time to reflect. They come back into the classroom with quite a different learning headspace on their head. It benefits and helps everybody. So I think there just needs to be more proact pra proactivity in really providing students that they have choices. Students, ex have to, students just now expect to go to university. It's no longer a choice. There is an expectation. And if you don't do what is expected, you're not on the norm. We need to go out and break that norm and say, take a break, go traveling. Um, even if you know, you're doing voluntary work, if you can afford it. I mean, one of the things is higher education changes widening participation groups' lives. And I think if we don't start changing what we're doing, the idea that we're going to be able to increase widening participation, because it's not happening. If you actually look at the polar groups who are actually participating, we're not getting the traction that we should do. And one of the big categories, we talk about BME, BME attainment, absolutely. But one of the big categories that we are struggling to get into university is the white male 18 to 21 year old working class person. Thank you. Now, so just one more really quick point before we have lunch. Gentlemen there. First, I refer to David Pond. I totally agree with you because I transferred with three different systems before I come to the UK. I think the UK is the most complicated system I haven't used. <laughs> so we do say that. Before, um, before I come to the UK, I was in Canada's OSSD system, which is Ontario system. Then I moved to um, Islands is a. I went to a undergraduate no foundation program, which is run by a study group. It's a UK company, and then because it's different rules and regulations of certified the different uh, university, it's very uncertain. i um, do not. I do not have enough confidence to predict that the university will upset of me or reach out to me. And then the first thing first is the prediction grade. I cannot help predict that is that too high or too low because it depends on the uh, offer, that offer to me or not. So it called me a jest. Now I'm also running a company for uh, education consultancies and I want to know how to reduce this uncertainty for the customers. I mean, I question. Mm. David, well, I, th I think it's actually there is an awful lot. We, you know, having been a head of careers and a, and a head of HE in schools and now doing it independently, I think there's an awful lot about the psychology of, of, of the process. And I think actually not a bad place to kind of finish off with is mm. what messages do students learn from going through our HE admission system? You know, what are we subconsciously telling them matters? Um, and I think when we look at you know, the wonderful discussion that Chris was on this morning about students, are 18 year old children or adults, this whole agenda that I know Sir Anthony is involved in of well-being at universities, how much of that comes from subliminal messaging we are saying to them in our uh, university system of so much of your life depends on hitting that mark on a couple of days. Mm. Um, the stress, the, all these kind of things. Every, every university system has stress, every university has it in different ways, but I think fundamentally we need to delve into this kind of bigger picture discussion of what do we want our universities to do? How do we want children to be experiencing them? Um, and then when we know what that will be, then I think it will probably be fairly straightforward as to how we select students in our system.